Hello, beautiful people. I am Oliver Perrin for Semiagog, joined today by the inimitable Mr. D, as well as Pharaoh. And the subject of our discussion this afternoon will be uh, aesthetics and uh, whether or not aesthetics can be uh, conceived as a, a guide for right action, as well as any number of aspects of how aesthetics and ethics may overlap or uh, uh, per perhaps not. Um, I've chosen uh, Mr. D and Pharaoh to join me in this discussion because both of them have a keen sense uh, for art, for material culture. Um, both of them seem to be uh, concerned as well with uh, ethics, though usually they just uh, express their disgust at the lack of it in our, in our uh, sad uh, current age. Um, so I'm very happy to have uh, both of them on. Before I welcome both of them and get this started, just uh, some brief, um, you know, a uh, uh, boilerplate nonsense at the beginning, follow this channel, Semigoc, as well as a safer space. You can do that on BitChute. You can do it on YouTube. And I also recommend you do it on Odyssey, which I love as a new platform because it actually has comments that I can control. I can step in and mute things. I can do all sorts of things in the comment section. And that, of course, allows me to engage with the public in ways that are, I don't know, impossible to manage on, uh, on BitChute. So uh, yeah, please do follow the channel there. You can follow me on Telegram. You can do it on, um, on Twitter, on Gab. Uh, and for those who wish to support the channel, there is GoFundMe and Subscribestar. I want to very briefly celebrate the Praetorian Chads uh, who make this channel possible. I will do that by showing you their mighty names inscribed in the Tablet of Life. Um, here you can see them. I'm gonna go ahead and make it larger because uh, these people deserve, as it says, all of the credit and none of the blame. Uh, they make this channel possible, and I thank them uh, very, very much indeed. Otherwise, there uh, there are my books, which you can find on Amazon. I invite you to check them out. If anyone is interested, you can um, you know uh, put something in the, the uh, uh, comments about it if you, you need a link or need to know more about it. Um, but I will skip uh, showing them today as we have the uh, anonymity of our icons on screen. Uh, and the uh, the other thing I should say is that uh, I only know of Pharaoh and of Mr. D because of the, the fine gentleman academic agent whose channel I very, very much enjoy. Um, I invite all of you to check his channel out, to subscribe, uh, and to sign up for his courses. I'd love to show for him. Go ahead and pay lots of money in order to learn about uh, economics. I'm, I'm sorry, very little money um, in, in the relative state of things for, um, for uh, knowledge of uh, what I think he's gotten calculus now and he's working on rhetoric and he's got economics and um, and logic. So definitely check him out. Um, all props to him and his channel. Um, and uh, I guess there it is. So uh, uh, hello, Mr. D. Hello, Pharaoh. How are you gentlemen doing? Yes, very good. Thank you very much. It's uh, be, uh, been pretty miserable weather in England and, and Wales, I believe. So uh, hmm. but apart from that, yeah, I'm, I'm doing reasonably well, as well as could be expected in our current world. But uh, yeah, it, it has been sort of apocalyptic out, outside. So if you hear my uh, wind chime going insane, it's right outside my window. I'm going to have to move it or else I'm never going to get sleep again if this weather keeps up. And, and of course, uh, Mr. D has had to come in because of the, the, the male curfews in Wales right now. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. Um, exactly. I'll be, I'll be hauled up before the... Uh, for the Amazon Tribunal, and I don't mean the Jeff Bezos kind. Yes, you're talking about the one tit kind. Um, <laughs> and, and and has that actually transpired, or is that simply something that's being uh, barked about in the uh, off on the periphery? For now, it's it's just an you know one of the many insane um, things being proposed by um, the uh, the equally insane devolved government of Wales. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I, I ignore. I ignore the insanity altogether. So whether it comes to pass or not, I don't think it's going to make any difference uh, where I am. But, uh, you know, uh, in interesting times, I will say. Yes, uh, rather like the uh, the, the, the putative uh, ancient Chinese curse. May you live in interesting <laughs> times, right? Yes, exactly. Ugh. Ugh. Well, yes, um, I, we're, we will be considering aesthetics and possibly how it overlaps with ethics. Um, I, I will just sort of throw out a uh, sort of basic introduction to why I wanted to talk about this. Um, in, in my own life, I have found that 
the best way for me to navigate circumstances in which I want to know what the proper course is, is to imagine myself as though I am on a stage with the, you know, in, in the midst of the circumstances that confound me at that moment, you know, uh, looking for the, the, the straight path rather than the crooked one out of them. And uh, I simply imagine myself in that, in that setting and I imagine, you know, taking uh, one uh, a course versus the other. Um, and then I think about or uh, open myself up to be receptive to whether or not um, I, I would like myself in those circumstances, whether it seems fitting and attractive or, um, or uh, uh, repulsive. And I have found in the course of my life that that is a much sure guide for me in terms of choosing uh, what to do or how to conduct myself than any number of different um, ways of having recourse to, to universal ethical principles or, or whatever. Um, however, it, it raises all sorts of questions because aesthetics, and in this case, I'm sort of looking at the vignette of me doing a thing or not doing a thing and forming an, an aesthetic uh, impression, um, aesthetics generally have to do with uh, beauty or what is perceived as beauty or harmony or symmetry and these sorts of things. And we know that that there is uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, thinking and talking in, in our Western culture that's gone on for quite some time that, uh, you know, uh, rightly points out how how completely unreliable or uh, untrustworthy beauty can be. And uh, just to um, sort of summarize that in an image, perhaps the only image we'll look at today since I'm, I'm never properly prepared with all sorts of visual aids. I'm gonna open this one up. Uh, this is an image from, uh, from uh, Bronzino, um, which I assume everyone is familiar with. It's very well known. And it's an allegory of uh, uh, Venus and Cupid. Uh, and, and we could see, you know, this sort of incestuous embrace between uh, Venus and her, her child Cupid. Um, and it, it, we've got the golden apple uh, and, and the Columba, the, or I'm sorry, uh, the, the dove there. Um, but we also have uh, these other figures surrounding um, Venus. And I, I bring up Venus in this. I hope it's clear because this is the goddess of uh, beauty and attraction who rules over things like desire. And so hopefully the, uh, the way in which this applies in a discussion of aesthetics would be apparent. Um, we've got this figure in the upper right who is very likely time um, with his hourglass um, sweeping back this sort of blue cloth, which could be the, the night sky. And there's the idea that time reveals truth. Um, and there's this figure off to the left, which some have interpreted as Nix for night. And I tend to um, accept that, that, uh, that interpretation. And so night, which casts the cloak over all of these affairs is being pushed back by time, which reveals it. And we can see that while in the foreground, um, you know, you could say maybe it's a little incestuous. You've got a, a, a cherub or whatever coming in to fling some flower petals, but you've got this freaked out person um, in the midst of rage and insanity, jealousy, who knows what it is off to the left. Um, we have the masks down at the feet of this arriving cherub, which um, suggests, I think relevant uh, to our conversation that that um, beauty is not always what it seems and, and calling into question, of course, uh, aesthetic judgments um, in and of themselves. Uh, and then behind the cherub, you have this figure figure that I think has quite rightly been um, called fraud or deceit. We see this, this innocent, attractive, childlike face there. Um, uh, but if you look at the hands, you can see if you are actually paying attention that the right hand is on the left and the left hand is on the right which certainly speaks of fraud and deception. Um, and then there is sort of this beast's haunch and uh, some part of a serpent's tail um, coming out from beneath that attractive face. So it, it suggests that um, perhaps um, this, this business of aesthetics is something that we should be very, very careful with. Um, but, but that's not the whole story. You know, we do know that uh, physiognomy can be a guide to genetics and things like facial symmetry can correspond to uh, health. Um, we know that, you know, shit stinks, rotting corpses stink. They produce a very negative impression. Um, and yet there's clear wisdom in staying away from them. Uh, the, the, sorry. Yeah, no, just, just following on from that, I think, I think it's, it's, 
very easy to gloss over and say, you know, how can you tie aesthetics to, to virtue and goodness? But um, you, you need to understand about how art is created as part of that and ideas of it either flowing from the mind or the body itself. And because um, you have this interaction with the artist through their mind or through their body and through your own body and through your mind, um, it's tied to, to who you are, your um, you know your belief system and the the virtues you you, you live your life as well. So actually, um, you know, if an artist is producing something from his mind, you know, what if he's got a twist, twisted mind? What if he's got a corrupt mind? Um, can you receive some of that through art? Um, or conversely, if, if the artist has a great mind and a great vision, but the people have a corrupted mind and they're not able to understand or interpret the art in the correct way, you know, m maybe there's a problem there. So w when you start to break down and think about um, how is art created? Um, is, is it the mind or the body uh, during that process? Actually, this idea of virtue being tied to aesthetics ha has been one that's been identified s since Roman times, basically, and, and, and I'm sure but before that. So it, at, at face value, you wouldn't say, you know, beauty and virtue are, are connected, but they, they really are. Interesting. D? Mm. I, <laughs> I would, I would, I would greatly uh, disagree with that sentiment. I don't think that uh, that beauty and virtue, at least, it depends upon what manner of virtue you're you're speaking of. But I don't think they're, in, I don't think that they're inextricably linked. Um. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think there, I think we probably have a sort of fundamental disagreement about the nature of these things. I think they can be linked. Uh, and I think that, you know, just the larger question that you've asked, you know, at the beginning of uh, sort of in the lead up to the stream, um, to, to what extent can aesthetic experience or the experience of beauty uh, lead towards virtue or right decision, right thinking? Um, I, I think that it, 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 it's, it's completely conditional. Um, so perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, later, I, I think also, you know, I mean, this 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 painting, uh, this Bronzino that we're talking about, is a kind of good example of that because, of course, it it is proposing all sorts of things. It's quite you know quite mysterious and it's quite complex um, symbology uh, being presented, but it's also using. Uh, I think it's it's drawing upon things and and sentiments that we. Would might maybe maybe would traditionally say are not so pure. Uh, I think that uh, there is great attention paid to flesh in this picture. Uh, literally, you know, you, uh, the figure of, of of Cupid is 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 presenting his firm young ass <laughs> straight at the viewer, uh, and and Venus um. is is Venus is pointing, you know, her, her full frontal, uh, and so again this picture is engaging with parts of the human experience that that we often think as more corruptible you know the sexual the erotic um and so i think that it just becomes a very muddled issue when you say that that uh, aesthetics and virtue are necessarily tied because i think it can go completely the opposite direction but uh, yeah well, just to kind of give you um, one example of historical views on this, a, a quite interesting place to start is the, the Romans themselves. You've got writers like um, Longinus um, and oh, obviously not Roman, but Greek, but um, Plato, um, thinking about how, thinking about the, the arts. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, originally um, in or to certain Roman notions, the arts were divided between the uh, liberales or the uh, igni I can't, my Latin's terrible, uh, ingen ingenui. So that's either the arts of the freedman or the slave. And the way that they divided um, those arts was obviously through this idea of freedom and slavery, but also um, the physicality of, of the um, art itself. 
so obviously if you kind of read plato his his view on um humans is that uh whatever that they're created with all of the knowledge and we have this amnesis um where we forget everything but the knowledge is there we've just forgotten it um and it's all about the soul and the body is the pr- you know the body is the prison of the soul so f- from this kind of platonic view any interactions with the or the, the more interactions with the body the kind of um less virtuous the the artwork is so if if you look and see what those liberales are you've got things like uh, again they they what they consider arts is obviously different to our modern interpretation but you've got gymnastics general ships eloquence grammar poetry and music all of those things um <clears throat> are kind of like the, the the higher forms because of their more like kind of less bod- bodily focus um well interestingly things like painting mosaic works and pottery because of their physicality um were considered to be a, a lower a lower kind of art yeah yes uh, yes there 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 is tr- traditionally been been that division and that division persisted you know very long into history i mean it was you know, you know often the what 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 i would call the plastic arts the arts involving things uh were kind of put on the level of, of artisan you know sort of artisanship uh but i i think that this you know uh, i think a- a- all everything that we receive is received through sense you know e- even you know even w- what we read you know what we read the w- the word of god you know uh what we see what we feel what we smell what we hear i mean it is all physical sensation reaching our body whether in rays of rays of light you know photons whether it's sound waves you know it 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 all enters us through our senses in in a way and so i think that this is a bit of an artificial uh distinction between things i think i think all you know all of human experience is it, at least it initially reaches us through our, through our senses so uh, i don't think it 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 can, i don't think the classical divisions really hold up but um i think they're an interesting guide for sort of seeing how different forms of human expression work uh yeah and and what's interesting like follow the kind of following the christianization of um the west and into the renaissance very much like D said, the, the the kind of body was re- revised up in the Chris- Christian traditions. The body is a temple, which you know, which um, houses the spirit. You know, so it, it it very much has a elevated position compared to Plato's idea of the the, the prison. So all all of a sudden, during the medieval and Renaissance period, the body becomes um, more virtuous, and and so basically those divisions degrade away pretty pretty quickly. Um, but then. There's kind of like a re um, juggling of the arts in terms of their aesthetic value into what we what we still call today the high and the the low arts. Um, so and and interestingly, things like um, um, you know, like mu- music was probably lowered down in terms of the hierarchy in the Roman system, while something like painting is then very much elevated to the highest highest standing and if you kind of read some of the kind of renaissance uh, artists of, of the time painting is the kind of top top level art in terms of um in terms of pure pure aesthetics um but d- d mentioned something really interesting around how we receive uh receive receive works and and um one interesting um way of thinking about things is uh, kind of mapped out by a guy, a guy called uh, benedetto croce Who's a, who's a aestheticist writing in uh, 1914, and he sees the production of art as uh, beginning with an artist having a vision um, at a kind of a like a spiritual or a mind level, which is then um, turned into something phys- physical um, through his production. Then a person is then a person enjoys the art by turning his eyes to the direction. Um, to which the artist has pointed out to him, and then he reproduces um, in himself the artist's image. So you've got this uh, kind of four-stage approach of how we receive art. Now, going back to Dee's point around um, um, virtue, 
it's I think I think it, I think it's all down to how you consider you know can this journey from vision of the artist to the vision of the receiver um, be cor- be corrupted um, a- along the way. Um, so, for example, um, if we were to pre- present um, that Bronzino painting to someone who has no idea of the classical landscape or the kind of meanings behind it, would they actually receive it? W- would they receive the same um, like value out of that painting as if they didn't have that information, if that makes sense? Yeah, there's a, there's an interesting point that uh, comes to mind for me <clears throat> in studying images. So, and- so, so you know, I, I'm sure Mr. D's very very keen on like the the idea of um, kind of a, a, elitism and how that you know, but, but like I think we need to recognise that not everyone is going to receive the same thing out of a piece of artwork if they haven't done the gr- the groundwork. Well, to, to I would learn go about further. It. I would go further and say that I, I think that that, that those things are so disconnected in, in that my experience as a creator, um, as, as a painter, uh, primarily, uh, uh, other, other forms of the plastic arts um, that I've engaged with throughout my career, I, I don't. I mean, there, there is a disconnect between that, you talked about these stages, and there's a disconnect between what, how I formulate what I'm about to do and what actually comes to pass. And in a sense... I am not really totally in control of what what I produce either. You know, what, once something comes out of the, the work of my hand uh, and mind, and, and all the things that goes into creating a work of art, it, it's it's some it it, it it attains a sort of life beyond my intentions, uh, and in a sense, there. I'm as it's as foreign to me as it is to someone who comes upon it in a way. Um, so I I do think that there 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 is a sort of life outside of the the intentions of the author. I mean, this is something that comes up certainly in in a modernist and, and postmodernist discourse uh, a lot. You know, um, to to what extent is the the the, the death of the author you know a, a component of of what someone produces uh and in a way you know we have the, the bronzino's relationship to this picture is gone it's lost even even at the time even during his life you know i don't even know that he could fully access what he had done um so so i do think that there there is a very strange relationship between between what one intends to do and what one actually does. Uh, and to me, that's that's the, the, the great animating part of it. You know, that's the mystery of it. I, I don't really know, uh, you know, that this fundamental, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's as if you're, you know, it's like producing a child, you know, at a certain point, you know, this is another life. This is a, this is another being, this is another entity in the world. And whatever my input, uh, I'm not in control of it fully. So it, it is a int- very interesting question. Uh, and, and am I uh, audible to you guys properly? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, good. Um, well then, it seems that we have a, a couple of issues here. Um, one of them is the idea of the subjective impression that's formed. And that subjective impression uh, partakes of all sorts of things from the level of instinct, right? Um, you know, uh, it's very common to see, you know, with, uh, with 17th century depictions of things and earlier, you know, women would often wear what my friend Tim likes to call tits on the half shell, you know, with the exposed nipples. There's a reason why, why we respond to such things. And that is instinctive and, and that is uh, carnal and uh, uh, driven by nature, who is, of course, a bloody handed bitch. You know, it's something that Giordano Bruno referred to as a, a Kirkean or Circean uh, enchantment in service of generation, right? Uh, as long as um, the desire yields the result, which is procreation, then it matters not how much misery, you know, is involved uh, uh, rolling along the wayside. So there's the role of instinct in it and whether or not that falls into a, a larger framework that might m- make uh, make nothing 
uh, or, or how, do, how do I say this, that might make of one's concerns about right action and all the rest uh, a mockery because of its smallness and its lack of significance against the, the evolutionary scale, so to speak. Um, then there is the idea, as I, I tapped, of the subjective um, characteristics of the person making the, the judgment. You know, if we're talking about a sadist or a masochist, um, there are things that they would view as being beautiful or attractive, um, you know, that, that uh, sort of wind them up or plug them in properly, if you will, um, that most people would certainly um, contest if it were, if, if that were set forth as some sort of standard of right action or behavior. And then the other part that we um, sort of have floating out here that remains to be addressed is uh, the idea of deception. Um, you know, leaving aside whether or not an artist has an intention and uh, sets it forth expressively in a forthright fashion, then you can, you know, wonder, as Dee just pointed out, whether or not that message gets carried forward, whether or not the context is entirely changed, you know, uh, who, who knows how it's going to be viewed uh, in future. But that, that doesn't even begin to um, touch upon the idea of deception. You know, if I, if I look and I see a politician speaking up at a podium, and um, you've got people in the audience, you know, shills who are sort of nodding and shouting agreement. And, you know, the politician is in front of a, a boldly displayed flag behind him. And a, a child comes up when he seems to have a dry throat and very politely, you know, with a bow in her hair, hands him a glass of water. All of that would look superficially as though it's attractive and therefore right and beautiful, etc. cetera. But um, what then of uh, deception? Uh, very likely the, the politician in our example here is just another one of the same old gang of assholes. Um, or take a look at beauty on the part of women with their fascination with uh, cosmetics, you know, with a blush to simulate a sexual flush, um, you know, uh, red lipstick to uh, create the impression of engorged labia, you know, or, or lip gloss to make them seem as though they're wet and receptive. Or my favorite image, actually, that embodies all of this as a sort of emblem is the idea of belladonna, which, of course, means beautiful lady. But uh, the drug itself um, causes uh, an increased heart rate and uh, a kind of pallor combined with a flush. So you've got more pale cheeks, but with a red flush. And at the same time, as I understand it, because uh, ophthalmologists uh, until fairly recently still used it, perhaps they still do, to dilate yep. the eyes. And when the eyes are dilated, there is a, signified thereby a kind of receptivity that you, in my experience, only see when someone is very, very deeply in love. You look at them and their eyes seem to be yawning in front of you because of their attraction to you, their desire for you. And, and this little emblem of belladonna, this drug a woman could take and, you know, perhaps bring herself close to the edge of death in doing so, would create a set of physiological signals that themselves would uh, be taken as indicating the most extreme arousal and attraction. And yet it's all a, uh, it's all nothing but a, uh, but a, a, a seeming, uh, you know, dissembling in some fashion or another. And so that, that sort of underscores the idea of deception. I wonder what uh, Pharaoh or UD would have to say to all of that. Well, I do think, uh, you know, uh, yes. And this is something that has, that has come up in the history of, of, of art and, and morality for, for many, very, very long time. The idea that, of course, contained with in all of this, contained with in all, the canon of beauty is also a, a dangerous trap, you know, and you, you can find many examples throughout the history of art and, and poetry and literature that, you know, that indeed you can be deceived by, by beauty and perfection. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, I would say it's a, it's a, it's one of the sort of fundamental tropes of, of certainly Western art. Yeah, West, commonplace, West, West, absolutely Western a commonplace. Thought. Yeah, uh, but so uh, you know, and I think the, the Belladonna example is, is very good. And of course, in 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 high enough dose, um, a trope of Belladonna is is you know is is, is of course deadly poison. Um, and, and so to to an extent, uh, I think beauty is also analog analogized often as being. A, a poison. Uh, one of my favorite sort of um, examples, and, and the one that I thought of when you, when we, when we were sort of discussing the stream, is a Clockwork Orange. Uh, uh, not the Anthony Burgess books uh, as much, although that you know it certainly is a component in the book. But especially in Stanley Kubrick's film, um, 
I think one of the points that is made in that film is that ostensibly this, the main character, Alex, has on the surface what we would call a very refined aesthetic. You know, he loves Beethoven over all things. And of course, Beethoven, you know, you think of the 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 Ninth Symphony, the the Ode to Joy. I mean, it is this sort of considered this transcendental work of 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 beauty and and uh, humanity, and yet Alex is a monster. You know, he's an ill-bred ruffian of the worst sort, and so, and he literally commits, you know, violence, and then you know, sort of brings himself to orgasm listening to to, to Beethoven, you know, the one of the, the ennobling great works of the 19th century. Uh, and so I think it it, it is, a, is a fundamental question that, that that great art did nothing but, did nothing to elevate him. You know, that character is not because of his appreciation and love of this this work. It does nothing to help him become a virtuous person in fact it's the inverse and and so this touches on what you would you were saying semi uh, you know this idea that um, you know what 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 is aesthetics in the hand of, hands of a monster you know um so I, I i i think that sort of gets to the root of why i i i don't think that virtue follows from beauty necessarily uh, i mean i mean just on that, someone like um, Ruskin would come in and say that the that the art does not just create uh, morality, or sorry, moral art, I should say. I mean, it's, it's to step him back a second, he he considers art to have three purposes: either the religious, the the moral and ethical, or the kind of f- the physical or useful. Um, um, with a hierarchy in that order, but with regarding kind of moral art. Um, so he he would consider something like the heroic Greek statues, for example, to to be moral works because their nature is to ennoble and inspire people to to um, you know make people better through the artworks themselves. They were you know installed by the state to kind of show this is what heroism is. This is the this is what manly virtue is. Um, but his point is, is is that you can't uh, that the art perfects morality that um it kind of it kind of adds the the buff or the polish on the morality that's there rather than like being able to generate it out out of nothing and that that there's that it's more like a it's more like a um you don't just for example just churn out a whole lot of moralistic art and then all of a sudden you've got a great civilization and everyone's on board and, and living these moral lives but it's this um organic process of creation and and uh, improving and improving and that the greatest civilizations come through like a process of creating um, these kinds of arts, the next generation or a better generation, uh, and, and um, so on and so on. I, I mean, whether I, I agree with that or not, I'm, I'm not necessarily um, sure. But um, what what I what I do think you can say, okay, well, h- again, here's an interesting question: Can art fundamentally change people's minds and lives? So, can 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 art be used to change their morality? Um, in, in general, and, and I would say when you look at, you know, we, we've gone through this in quite a lot of detail in, in AA's propaganda streams. Propaganda is, a, especially the posters, are one of the lowest forms of art. You know, advertising is probably the, the worst and lowest form of art out there. Lower but, still, yes. Yes, but but still, it, it is an art form that uh, puts ideas in people's heads. And, um, you know, I, I I think it's undeniable that propaganda can change people's minds um or create create ideas about um other people so you know we looked a lot we looked on those streams a lot about dehumanization um what art's very good at is actually saying this is what someone or something looks looks like so for example the the uh, american propaganda portraying the japanese as these buck tooth uh misshapen um monsters um that's 
for people who for, for for you know I know people in the south who have never seen a Japanese person before that is the idea of what a Japanese person is so that art that artwork is sort of gone in their heads and now they see the Japanese person as a a monster or a um an abhorrent person and it will affect their actions yes but to to, to a certain degree i mean it's it, it is this brings up a question of well what is you know you say that propaganda is a sort of low or advertising is a low form of art but many of the great works of what we would consider fine art were just as much that sort of propaganda as as those posters i mean they were conceived uh, to <clears throat> to sort of ennoble certain ideas and certain people, uh, they were commissioned. They they had a very specific program of symbology and depiction that were meant to convey certain ideas about the the, the greatness of a person or the greatness of a system or a, or a state or whatever. And so you know that w- will be lost to some degree to time. You know, again, they think I think these meanings are, are erode. As, as time passes and people pass away, generations pass away. But, you know, you, you can walk through the National Gallery and, you know, I'd say fully at least a quarter of those pictures had a very specific purpose, whether it was a religious purpose or a political purpose or, or, or what have you. Um, they, they were also propaganda. They were, they were meant to direct people's thoughts in a certain way. So I, I don't know. I think these distinctions aren't so clear as... as we, you know, some of us might think see, think they are. You know. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree about that. They can, they, they, the, the artworks have a purpose behind them. But I think you've got to be careful when you use the word propaganda, because in my mind, it's always tied to mass media and kind of, the, and also the, the mass man as well. Um, it, it's all about creating uh, an art- artistic message that can be transferred into the minds of hundreds of thousands of people. Very, very mm-hmm. simple. While, while the, the kind of propaganda, I, I would describe it more as like a, an elite symbology. It's that they would, they would mask uh, and, and often hide uh, meanings in things that you're, you know, a peasant at the time would have no idea. The, the, a peasant would look at the painting and say, oh, that's a nice painting, but n- miss out on all of those kind of, um, deviously hidden, deceptive, beautiful me- messages as part of it. So that that's where, where in my mind there's that differentiation. It's um, it's propaganda of sorts, but for like an, an an elite who is in the know and has access to that that kind of symbolic land, landscape. While what we call propaganda today is this accessible mass man, simple one idea, repetitive um, <clears throat> form. So we have, uh, on the one hand, we have uh, this theme that continues to be present, which is the idea of subjectivity. Um, and so, you know, if we pull from Hamlet, you know, why then tis none to you for there is nothing either good nor, uh, or bad, but thinking makes it so, you know, in reference to Denmark, he says, to me, it's a prison, right? Um, and that this sort of uh, speaks, uh, God, I just use this expression speaks to, which I've just decided I'm removing from my vocabulary because it's despicable. <laughs> Sorry. It does, I, have, I, does have those terrible connotations, doesn't it? Yes, it's just repulsive. I, I apologize to myself and to everyone else. I just I just uh, um, violated my own sense of aesthetics and saw myself doing it, and I'm disgusted. Um, so, uh, but but this this... You, you see how it sort of um, underscores this idea of subjectivity. Uh, then there's interpretation, um, which uh, Farrell was just talking about, the idea that uh, perhaps, you know, it's it's like a line from Blake. What is it? The, um, the fool does not see the same tree that a wise man sees, you know, um, and, and so there's subjectivity uh, and interpretation. But I think there's also this idea of deception um, that that I, I'm just going to keep underscoring here because for me, it has so much to do with any experience of beauty. I mean, think about like uh, earrings hanging from a woman's ears. I love them the way they sparkle because it's the idea of a fishing lure. And what happens when the fish goes for the lure? Um, to pull another one, I just pulled it up here because I only have it half memorized and I want to um, re- recite it properly. But this is from uh, this Bassanio speaking in The Merchant of Venice. I don't doubt you guys are both familiar with it, but perhaps it will be new to some of our listeners. He says he's confronted at this point where he has to choose between three chests. One is made of uh, gold, one is made of silver, and one is made of lead. And as he's imagining which of these chests he's going to choose, and it's important for him in his pursuit of this lady, 
um, he, he, he says the following, he says, so may the outward shows be least themselves. The world is still deceived with ornament. In law, what please so tainted and corrupt, but being seasoned with a gracious voice obscures the show of evil. In religion, what damned error, but some sober brow will bless it and approve it with a text, hiding the grossness with fair ornament. There is no vice so simple, but assumes some mark of virtue on his outward parts. How many cowards whose hearts are all as false as stairs of sand wear yet upon their chins the beards of Hercules and frowning Mars, who, inward searched, have livers white as milk, and these assume but valor's excrement to render them redoubted. Look on beauty, and you shall see it is purchased by the weight which therein works a miracle in nature, making them lightest that wear most of it. So are those crisped, snaky, golden locks, which make such wanton gambles with the wind upon supposed fairness, often known to be the dowry of a second head, the skull that bred them in the sepulchre. Thus ornament is but a guiled shore to a most dangerous sea, the beauteous scarf veiling an Indian beauty. In a word, the seeming truth, which cunning times put on to entrap the wisest. And I'll just, for people who don't understand that remark about the crisped, snaky golden locks, has reference to the uh, practice in that age of shaving the heads of the dead in order to use their hair to produce wigs. Um, and, and, and that in itself is obviously a very carefully chosen and very effective emblem that uh, Shakespeare has set forth here. And I, I would turn around and, uh, you know, offer up these observations to the two of you and see what you make of them, if you can avoid, you know, tearing into each other. Pharaoh, you, you after, after, after you, after you, after you. Uh, it's a difficult question. I, I, um, uh, no, no, you go ahead, Pharaoh. I, 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 I yeah, I'm, I'm sort of trying to formulate uh, my thoughts about that. Yeah, the so su subjectivity and um, yeah, d deceit. Like, like I think on on the de deceit front, um, just one element of that is. Um, again, thinking about Croce's framework for artistic creation, uh, again, and this idea of the just imagine for a, se a se for a second there is a bad actor. There is a, there is a an artist who w wishes to manipulate people, and and like I've talked about before with the idea of propaganda, we know that we can get certain ideas in people's heads. You know, um, just like we can perfect uh, perfect morality, we can do the same. We can slowly erode it um, negatively. But um, someone who's smart would not be upfront with their um, kind of a, their attempt to debase certain ideas, and so would wrap it in um, you know something beautiful and something interesting and something exciting. And you know when when I th when I think about um, you know m modern virtues and modern morals. Um, I think one one of the key mediums for the erosion of that has been something like um, you know Hollywood or you know movies and TV. Again, we can have another debate like about the kind of true artistic nature of it, etc. But the the cunningness of something like um, a movie is that they kind of wrap quite insidious ideas around um, interesting storylines, beautiful people. Um, uh, amazing, 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 amazing sets, and so people get super excited about the, these worlds that are being created for them. But they're having um, ideological ideas implanted in their heads at the same time that they don't even realise is what's going on. So I think I think that connection between you know beauty having this kind of darker edge to it as well is uh, definitely true. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I think that Shakespeare was doing the exact same thing. I mean, it was a, certainly a different scale and a different medium, but, you know, it was ever thus. I, I don't know. I think that, you know, you, you seem to, to, to be making inferences about modernity that I think apply to, to, to some sense to things of all time. I mean, yes, of course, the scale and the intentions uh, of these things have changed over time, but... Um, I, I just don't think that there's a fundamental difference uh, 
you know, Shakespeare was, 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 was to some degree doing the same things, uh, that, uh, the most pernicious Hollywood production is also doing. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree. I just think that there's more of, well, I, I think with Shakespeare, it's interesting because it's, it is often quite hard to determine his views and, you know, it, I'm sure a certain other person in our sphere would would be much more knowledgeable about uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare than, than I am. Don't don't, don't count on it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let me get that dig in there. Um, ha- however, um, yeah, but so but it, it's often quite hard to tell what he, um, you know um, what his actual um, moral framework is. There's discussions whether he was a Catholic or a Protestant. There's discussions whether he was a subversive figure, uh, et, et cetera. Um, but obviously, you know, the, the, the genius of Shakespeare is that he's always keeping you guessing. And there's layers upon, la- there's layers, upon layers of symbology. And, um, you know, he, he, he doesn't wear just one mask. He, he'll have like three or four stacked on top of each other. Um, so you, you're constantly trying to work out what's, what's the truth and what is reality. And... Um, um, so I, th- I think I think you're right. I think um, I-, I think what we have seen change is basically since um, like communist Russia. Basically, the uh, um, th- that in my mind is one of the key moments of art being used as um, an effective tool of propagand- propag- propagandization and virtue manipulation. So I'm, I'm, I don't know how familiar you are with the um, agitprop work that was done by early communism yes yeah quite quite familiar yes yes my, uh, me also yeah so just just for the just for the audience um they would the, the communists would literally um send out small groups of actors to the rural co- rural countryside to get uh basically ideas across and and it would be it's um, it's literally like ag- agitation propaganda is is the sh- is the kind of lengthening of it. Um, but but f- say for example, you want to talk, you want to get, you want to convince convince a village that they need to um, uh, you know send their women off to the factory, for example, in a society which has had the woman in the home for ages. Um, you would you know they they spent a lot of time, money, and effort using art in a way to to change those uh, moral moral virtues and actually what's interesting about something like agitprop it continued into the west through someone like uh, Bertolt Brecht who was a card carrying communist member but also i mean he never said this I, I think he hid it in his lifetime didn't he brecht um but you know he's obviously very well held up today for example you know he was he was literally um Put on by the National Theatre only three three years ago, and um, in his memoirs, you know, he specifically stated that he's trying to get these communist ideas across. And a, a, another idea would be, um, oh, I've forgotten his name now. He did St. St. Joan, and um, oh, uh, I, I, I can't remember. He's a member of the Fabian Society. I'll remember it in a second. But basically, um, it's interesting how. At, at the point of communism, basically, um, art becomes weaponized to change values and to change ideas in a way that we've never seen before. So again, someone like Shakespeare, he's just playing around. He's he he isn't trying to change a nation. Um, you know, I guess you could say maybe the Puritans, to a degree, did that when they kind of literally shut down uh, all the artistic all the artistic institutions and art in general. But they didn't try and subvert it. It was mainly just trying to trying to stop it. But um, yeah, basically, early communism was the first time they realized, oh, okay, we can use theater, we can use um, posters uh, as a way of cha- changing opinions in a, in a mass c- kind of way. But there's, there are early, earlier examples, I mean, certainly in terms of a, a, a methodical attempt to um, subvert, um, destroy and replace a whole uh, a whole sets of uh, cultural elements. Sure, we we see it um, arguably at least for the first time deployed at that scale with uh, the communist period. But just in terms of looking at how art can shape one's attitudes um, in ways that might you know uh, take you off the the straight path and onto the crooked one, or you know uh, 
peel you away from virtue and, and, and dump you into the lap of vice. I mean, there, there are a number or, or just waste your time in your life by filling your head with foolishness. There are a couple of examples. One of them is uh, from, um, I'm trying to remember, it's, uh, it's uh, Paolo and Francesca in, um, in the Divine Comedy. You know, the, Dante stops with his guide Virgil and he sees these guys, uh, th these two being blown about in the darkness um, and this vast void of darkness by these winds over which they have no control. And that sort of represents the passions. And you hear the story of Paolo and Francesca, two people who were not married, but they were, they were reading romances together and they lingered over a particular passage and then it got carried too far and they ended up getting involved with each other and it had a very terrible ending. And now they're, they're down in hell. Um, another example that's, um, uh, less well, I guess it's still literary, but it has its basis in well, hell, I can't even say it about Dante's story because those were two actual characters, uh, people I'm sorry, he knew of who he, whom he incorporated into his story. Another example of that is uh, is with um, what's his name, the the Spaniard, uh, Cervantes. Um, it, he was a soldier, a lot of people don't not know that he had his um. He was terribly uh, wounded at the Battle of Lepanto, you know, on the sea between the Turks and the, the, the Christians. And uh, he, he basically retired from his life of soldiering with a maimed arm and he became a writer. And the whole thing of his story of, uh, of uh, Don Quixote or whatever is, is basically mocking the romances that had filled his head with all these ideas as a young man and had him go off to war. So he's got, you know, uh, Don Quixote tilting at windmills and he's got, the, you know, the helm of Mambrino, which is a, just a damn shaving bowl um, on his head. And he mocked it, you know, one way, uh, one way and the other. Um, and so we, we see how um, there, there are these programs that people took issue with in the past. And of course, they continue today, possibly, you know, uh, more methodical, like the, the example of the communist propaganda. And they, they, they hold out the promise of something beautiful, which perhaps isn't like you've got gangsters in a gangster rap video who hold their guns sideways, which is a good way not to use your weapon well and to get shot and die. They, they, they treat women horribly, which is a good way to have a whole society break down because you're um, gender pairing and uh, well, I should say that with D on this channel, perhaps he'd jump in and say the best thing that you could do is abuse women. But um, <clears throat> leaving that aside, you know, they, they show a, a certain course of behavior as being successful when it is in fact not. Um, so, you know, if you call women bitches all day long, is that really the foundation of good relationships that produce good offspring and, you know, strengthen your culture? Or is it, in fact, a way to show something which is highly unsuccessful as though it is? Um, and so we come back to, to deception. And we just keep hitting these same themes of the subjectivity on the part of the person who makes the judgment, the, the difficulty with which uh, difficulties we're faced with if we go towards in interpreting the intents of the artist, uh, uh, you know, and, and the possibility of deception. And if we move it away from the artist and just look at beauty as a phenomena, whether created by human beings or not, um, it, we arguably still have these same issues. So I wonder what this brings to mind for you, gentlemen. You yeah, know, I would agree with all, all of those sentiments for sure. Like one, one thing I, I would um, additionally say, which is interesting, that um, in, if if we can say that, you know, like like I think in my mind it's obvious that that attempts have been made at erod eroding virtue um, through um, art in the last hundred years or so. But what's also d interesting, conversely, is um, attempts to um, build up virtue have all but stopped at the same time. So again, if you look at um, the 19th century and before, like I said, th this idea of the moralizing power of certain forms of art um, was something that was considered and something that was attempted. But, but in the 20th century, again, I mean, D, D correct me if I'm wrong here, those ideas were pretty much jettisoned and um, scorned. Um, and so, we've by, got this... wait, by whom? <laughs> I mean, yeah, but certainly like, that was that was that was one strain of thought. But I, I don't think that you can distill the the vast practices of the twentieth century into you know into that one idea. No. 
But what, what, what I'm saying is that, that would you say that the modernists would think that art has, um, has a moralizing power? I think that some of them would. It would certainly de de depend. I mean, you know, you, you have to think, I mean, you know, the example most sort of people think about when they think about modernism is like, well, if you think about it, like abstraction, you know, abstract painting. But I mean, some of those artists were sort of drawing on 19th century ideas of the of of of, of the transcendental, you know, uh, and the, the the sublime and and all of that, you know, when and they would, you know, they they thought of their vast sort of canvases as as sort of analogous to, you know, the kind of landscapes of the sublime period of the 19th century. So I think it it depends upon what sort of virtue you know kind of talking about it. I mean, as a kind of codified dogmatic, you know system of um, you know sort of victorian values or something like that yeah i would suppose that, that that had mostly subsided but i think it 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 becomes more about the the kind of which art world you're talking about because i think there are many different many different spheres working uh, in in the contemporary sense um yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that was a little bit too harsh. Thinking back now, like I'm, I'm just thinking if if we just use heroism as an example, something that again as as a strand was considered to be important and was gl glorified through art, and and like this idea is uh, these ideas of manliness. Um, I, I think there are def definitely strains of may maybe early modernism up to the second Second World War, for example. Um, from both sides, you know, you could see, for example, you know, fa fascist Italy um, were very big on, you know, uh, manly virtue and her heroism. E even like the icon iconographic, the mm. uh, I iconizing of um, the Duque himself is is an attempt at generating, like, using his him as a heroic ro Romanesque figure. But the same the same could be said for for, for Britain and um, you know Churchill. You know, Churchill with a you know with a with a Tommy gun and stuff like that. They're, they're kind of classic classic picture. Um, but maybe maybe I'd say after the Second World War, um, those attempts basically stopped. In 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 my, in my opinion, like it's it's interesting around your your point around the sublimity sublim, uh, sublimity and uh, ab abstract abstract art. Um, and, and and yeah, maybe there's something to be said there, and I, and I think for, for 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 edge cases, but um, there is another interesting point here as well, and that is to um, okay, can can you uh, uh, understand and paint or or like cr create these ideas of heroism without understanding what it is to be a hero at the same time? Um, so, <laughs> do you, what do you think the great artists of the past who who painted a sculpted heroes you think they knew what what true heroism was i i i i i would say that not i would say they created that that idea they they, they sort of created this image of heroism but uh, i certainly don't think most of them were not soldiers themselves most of them have not served in those capacities themselves you know so no, I we, think, have, I don't know. we have we have the example of uh, Cervantes, you know, as I just mentioned, was a soldier, and look at how, uh, you know, consistently he mocked it, you know. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I, th I think they would have seen it, though. They, they would have understood what it is. For example, if you would have gone, if you could have gone back to the 15th century and said, well, what does a heroic figure look like? You know, they would have said maybe like a soldier or again a noble king or something like that. If you were to ask someone off the off the street what a hero is today, they would say you know a woman going out by herself at ten p.m. You know, yeah, or, or or someone who got killed. You know, doing whatever. Maybe, but I think, but I think, I, I think that's not true. I think most sort of the the man in the street would say you know Superman, and well, you know, yes, you could sort of denigrate the the degradation of of you know this these iconographies of heroism from into marvel you know in and dc comics but in a sense that's just a continuation of this trope of of the muscular the muscularity of heroism that had existed since ancient times you know so i do think that those icons are still alive and they and they still function i mean despite what 
the powers that be would like, despite that they want want people to start to think otherwise. But I do think a lot of those those tropes are still very common in people's imaginations. But uh, that, that's actually a great example, like, though, because if you compare like perceptions of like um, someone like Superman or Captain America in 1940s, it was these kind of wholesome Amer- American. Um, you, you're right; these t- total hundred percent heroic figures. But if you look at like modern depictions of those characters, they're always these kind of dark, uh, anti-hero-esque, complicated, brooding characters, deeply flawed. Um, you know, they're constantly questioning what they're do- if they're if they're doing is right. Um, in in my mind, those those very examples have been uh, specifically subverted by uh, the, the media, and uh, like uh, I, I think in general, I, uh, these kind of bigger ideas have just been eroded and ground down, and all we're left again, that, like that's literally all we're left with is comic, you know. Poor, poor forms of comic book characters are the only kind of w- ways that we can approach heroism, as opposed to the hundreds of examples. Uh, you know, ev- everything's being banned. You know, for example, like um, um, the 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 Odyssey. You know, Achilles, what, the the classical Western canon heroic figure, has been removed from from schools and is now not being al- allowed to be taught. Um, and so, you know, how can we as a civilization understand heroism when the only hero that we're allowed to have is this, you know, um, doubting half half hero that's excess- that's that's created in popular culture, like the lowest form, <laughs> the lowest form of culture? No, I don't know. I, I I think that you know those efforts are futile. You know, I think that. I would, you know, I would put more faith in the power of these symbols and the power of, of, you know, just just the, the the kind of natural order of things. I mean, I think the yes, they can certainly try to try to warp and subvert and, and remove these things uh, from humanity, but it's not going to work in the end. It isn't going to work. We know it's not going to work. In fact, just the fact that they're they're having to you know, to sort of exert these pressures shows that it's an uphill battle battle for them. I mean, certainly, you know, yes, they, they there will be damage, but I just think that it's 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 futile because some of these symbols are so powerful and so inextricably tied to, you know, just our nature as 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 human beings. So, uh, uh, in a sense, I'm perhaps less pessimistic about this than than are you, but I, I think that. Some of these things persist because because there is some sort of natural uh, innate quality to them that is you know that is firmly tied to the human experience. Well, then we have the idea of uh, instinct, and in, 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 I mean we have at a minimum the idea of instinct, uh, and very likely as well some notion of of the archetypal that's inherent in what you just observed, and so. I wonder if we could move from the the art itself um, and the the intentions, putative or otherwise, of the people who created it um, to the idea of the the subject um, encountering that which is beautiful and what conclusions can be drawn from it, if if any. I mean, I, I know uh, Pharaoh has looked quite a bit at the, the sort of long line of uh, thought and um, expression, um, I, I would guess at any rate, because he had he just sort of thrown some things out there um, offhand that showed a great deal of familiarity with uh, the subject of aesthetics and people's reactions and responses across you know, uh, some span of history. Is, is there anything you can offer us, Pharaoh, in terms of how the uh, ancients looked at the idea of the, the subject and the, the impressions that were formed and whether or not they were in any sense reliable or anything sort of vaguely associated with that? What do you mean by subject? Sorry, the, the subject of the artwork or the person who's viewing the, per- the artworks? And, sorry. The, 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 the latter, the person viewing it, the impressions they form, the reactions they form, etc. Just to, just for a moment to step away from the artists and the art, because, you know, there's a central aspect of this, which is the person who's confronted with beauty and w- w- what they are to make of it. 
Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting question. From um, my understanding, it's not it's not even thought about until like the post Renaissance period. Um, all of the focus is on the artist itself. Um, the, the kind of exception. So basically, when you start to kind of go. Um, well, aesthetics is really interesting because it's actually a relatively modern philosophical idea which springs out of the Enlightenment. So ag again, if we're when we're talking about guys like um, you know um, Baumgarten and his reflections on poetry, uh, Kant's critique of judgment and Burke's um, phil philosophical inquiry into the origin and ideas of the sublime and the beautiful, it's at that kind of period where. Um, these kind of deeper ideas of um, the artist and the um, kind of viewer come together. So basically be before that, everything's focused on the artist itself. But because it's got this kind of enlightenment core, it's very much focused on um, enlightenment understandings of the body. And um, this, is, this is where kind of aesthetic sort of spills over into loads of different weird, weird areas. So, for example, you know, Mr. D talked about the senses at the start. Um, there's a really interesting um, history around kind of the, 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 the psychology of the body, basically. Like, how do we receive information? How is it interpreted? Um, you know, wh where does information go and how does it get fired out again? And obviously, with Enlightenment, it's all about rationalism. It's all about, you know, um, I think, therefore I am. And so there is very much this physicality placed on um the kind of receiving of art it's all about the senses you have then going in to um, the mind now the idea of the mind then sort of gets twisted a little bit during the romantic period where you've got um someone like coleridge um very much like the romantics love uh, imagination and um coleridge goes into a lot of detail about um, like what goes on in, in in someone's head or soul, and he describes it as um, the fancy. So you know, when we, we call something fancy today, that's actually derived from this romantic notion of uh, a place where we can receive and interpret the artist's vision. Yes, in Xanadu, a state, uh, did Kubrickan a stately pleasure dome decree? Uh, yeah, so. Yes, I, and I do think that this this whole sort of topic is, of aesthetics is inextricably tied up with uh, the these ideas coming out of the Enlightenment. I mean, I think the I think the the use of the term aesthetics comes from the 18th century, if I'm not mistaken. So I think Pharaoh is right. I think that uh, you know the the whole idea of studying uh, aesthetics is linked with with some of these enlightenment and romantic era ideas. And I, I do think that the whole, you know, the concept is very, is very much a romantic one, uh, you know, in, in the classical sense of romanticism. Well, but, there is, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. All, all, all I was gonna say was that there's an interesting consequence of this focus on ideas of the body and the soul. And um, so basically one thing that gets lost uh, in this kind of enlightenment period understanding of the ascetics is ideas of the passions. So um, the passions is a really interesting topic. And again, it's all derived from Plato, this idea that the, um, um, there's two like parts to the soul, the rational soul and the vegetable soul, uh, which is a great name, great name, Plato. Um, and the vegetable soul is, um, this is where your kind of like uh, your lower responses come from. So when we talk about things like um, creativity, destruction, lust, desire, these are all like in your kind of lower vegetable soul. And then the, the, the virtuous man is someone who is rational and the rational part of his soul can control the passions. And so this idea in, in, the, medieval, in, in the medieval idea, the man who can control the passions, is, who masters the passions, that's, that's the virtuous man. And there's the idea of the impression that is received and whether or not it gives birth to a passion. Yes, the um, I actually have a poem called Vegetable Soul based on that distinction. <laughs> um, but there's the, the, the animal as well, um, that which moves, whereas the, the vegetable creeps and has uh, less sentience, arguably, within that framework, which is really, in many respects, um, 
um, Neoplatonic. The, the seeds of it, like so many Neoplatonic things, are in the original works of, uh, of Plato. But there's, there, I think there's, there's, there's more to it. You know, I, we, we could say certainly that the emergence of aesthetics, from what little I know of it, you know, lies within this framework uh, that you guys were laying out that you don't really see it earlier. But the idea of the subject and the impression they form and the role of beauty and uh, the, 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 um, the triggering of an emotional response in forming a lasting impression that then in turn has a role in ethics um, is something that I think I think we can see much earlier. I mean, take a look, for example, at like a, a, an altarpiece by a Grunwald, you know, where you, you can literally see all the snapped off thorns sticking into the skin of the Christ, you know, and the, the horrible mortification of the flesh and, and the rest. That was designed to seat a memory image on the part of the person viewing it associated with certain things. And, and, and if we go back a good bit further, there is the idea of the art of memory that I'd like to talk about quite a bit. I'm always sort of, um, you know, uh, chirping from the, the, the sidelines when AA talks about memory palaces saying, man, that this is just the most disgusting, um, superficial flattening of, of, of this art that goes all the way back to the, the Greeks and the Romans. Um, but he, of course, just knows about the recent popularizations of it, which they call a memory palace. But the way it was actually taught, the idea, well, first off, it was a part of rhetoric, which is important to understand because rhetoric is designed to um, persuade, to convince, convincere, you know, to, to, to bind or to convince or to persuade or to move someone in your direction or away from another thing. I mean, we can get into all the stuff of whether or not, the, you know, you have the, the sophist's idea of rhetoric, which is, you know, to convince them that white is black and black is white. It's very um, mercenary in that respect. You have the, the, the Socratic idea, which is that the function of rhetoric is to lead man towards truth. Leaving all that aside, with rhetoric, you have the idea of convincing and persuading. And you can look at uh, the works of, for example, a uh, Cicero. Um, who, who has whole sections on the virtues and vices and how the rhetor um, should conjure images both of virtue and vice in order to move his audience. Um, but you, you can move on further and see that the, the, the rhetorician who forms images in their mind in order to remember parts of the speech is also forming images to have them to hand, to, so to speak, um, to share them with the audience in such a way that those images come to life within the, uh, the soul of the listener, and then those images shape and move them, uh, particularly when you have the fall of the classical world and rhetoric sort of moves more so into the realm of um, the text and the monastery and the Christian context. It's very important that these images sort of activate the soul to drive it towards something higher or to dissuade it from moving towards sin. Um, but, but, but the important part about the art of memory is that you form images in the mind and the ancients, again, I'm, I'm sort of circling around this idea of, of uh, aesthetics and the response to images and the formation of an emotional impression being something recent and how the ancients really didn't talk about that. I would say arguably they did because th there's a very sophisticated aspect to medieval psychology in the formation of images. There's the idea of intentio, which is in, as a Latin technical term, it doesn't mean intention. It means the, the context that went with an image when it was seated in the soul of the person. Of course, this, the, the, the way they understood it, particularly with the Thomas, you know, Albertus Magnus and Thomas Aquinas, the idea was that the, the image was, came in through the senses, as we've been talking about, um, and, and then it came to this sort of atrium of sense that they called the common sense, the Aristotelian common sense, which you can read about in De Anima. And in that, the, the various um, elements of the senses come together in a synesthetic impression, the common sense, not meaning common sense like Thomas Paine would talk about or like good old fashioned horse sense, but the common sense where <laughs> the various elements are assembled into a syn synesthetic impression. Um, and the important thing about the idea of intentio is this notion that when the image is impressed, it carries with it an emotional context relative to how the person felt when the image was formed. And yeah, just, hmm. just, just, just on this, it's really interesting because, again, um, the two of the biggest medieval passion scholars, uh, Augustine and Aquinas, who wrote heavily on that, use that 
intensity of word as part of their understanding of the of the passions. It's like um, you receive something and then it drives you to do something. Now, I want to bring up something, but be a little bit pernickety with something you said there, semi apologies, but um, your use of the word emotion, because it, it, this is this is what's interesting. Emotion as a word only comes out of the 19th century um, in a kind of new scientific understanding of what moves people. And actually, um, basically, what effectively happens is this idea of the passions and intentio gets replaced with this idea of emotion, which is like, you know, how do you feel about something? And so there is a shift in understanding about what art can do to us from intentio, where you can see it's just like it's just like you described. You see, you see the artwork and then you get moved by it. It moves the passions. But with emotions, it's about how does it make me feel? There is you lose that kind of um, uh, action to it, which I think is a really interesting change, in, a fundamental change in understanding. Um, and so a lot of this kind of modern, like um, when it, whenever you kind of hit, hear like a low grade GCSE art teacher talk about art, they're always like, you know, how does this painting make you feel? Well, the, the medieval mind wouldn't think of it like that. They would say, you know, what does this, <laughs> what, what does this painting make you do? So it, it, it's, it's it's really interesting how just our fundamental understandings of um, psychology and the human soul and body then impact our total understandings of how we receive art. And well, I, I do think that 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 how how does it make you feel? That is something I think that has direct lineage in Romanticism. And certainly, certainly, the that that was all just the idea was just strengthened by the Victorians in a certain way. So. Yeah, you know, we we have a different understanding of it, certainly. But I I, I do think that that was part and parcel of uh, you know anything that is wrapped up in romantic ideation um, is this 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 sense of the of the emotion. Um, the this I, I would I would say it's a it's a it's a feminine understanding rather than a masculine understanding. Well, I do like uh, very much um, what uh, Farah touched upon there with this idea of not how does it make you feel, but what does it make you do? And I think it's fair to, to Dee's uh, point just now made that um, you, you could say that how it makes you feel versus what it makes you do, you know, in many respects, you could sort of drop one side of that on the feminine and one side of that on the masculine sort of archetypally. But specifically, this idea of what does it make you do and the idea of the passions as a goad or a prod, right? As, as some people may know in Latin, stimulus is literally the word for a cattle goad, you know. So if it stimulates you, it goads you, it pricks you, um, you know, goad, gad. Um, so... Uh, there's the idea, and, and this is this is a, a nice place to uh, arrive at at this point in the conversation because it's the idea of the image with its associated intentio, the emotional framework or the passions that move you as a context for the image coming in with that image at the point that it arrives in the common sense and makes an impression on the memory. There's very much this idea um, that the associated emotional charge with the image serves as something that we have in the treasure house of our memory that we can have recourse to when we need to know about right action. And there's, as you guys were talking, it occurred to me that there's this bit from a, a really excellent book called The Book of Memory, A Study of Memory in Medieval Culture. It's by Mary Carruthers. Um, and she relates this um, little bit. It's an anecdote um, you guys will know, but uh, perhaps our viewers won't know. There's the story of Abelard and Eloise, and uh, Abelard was a, um, a, a scholar and philosopher in the Middle Ages. I'm, I want to say 12th century. I, I may have that wrong, but um, but he basically got involved with uh, Eloise, and he shouldn't have been. And so a bunch of her relatives showed up and um, unmanned him, cut off his man parts, um, and uh, Eloise in uh, in her state um, ended up taking the veil and went off into a convent because it was just this horrible mess for everyone involved. Um, and, and in the course of uh, taking the veil, there's this one story here, and this is um, Abelard is um, writing here, I believe. And uh, the translation goes, I admit that it was shame and confusion in my remorse and misery rather than any devout wish for conversion, which brought me to sh seek shelter in a monastery cloister. 
Eloise had already agreed to take the veil in obedience to my wishes and entered a convent. So we both put on the religious habit, I in the Ab Abbey of St. Denis and she in the convent of uh, Argentui, I can't pronounce French, so forgive me, uh, which I spoke of before. There were many people, I remember, who in pity for her youth tried to dissuade her from submitting to the yoke of monastic rule as a penance too hard to bear, but all in vain. She broke out as best she could through her tears and sobs into Cornelia's famous lament. Now Cornelia, for those who don't know, is a famous Roman woman um, seen as emblematic of virtue. So in the midst of this crisis, after the guy she was in love with got his balls cut off and she's a beautiful young woman who's now gonna have to go off to a convent and there's a crowd of people standing around her telling her not to do this. She repeats Cornelius' famous lament, "Oh noble husband, too great for me to wed, what was it my fate to bend that lofty head? What prompted me to marry you and bring about your fall? Now claim your due and see me gladly pay. So saying, she hurried to the altar, quickly took up the veil blessed by the bishop, and publicly bound herself to the religious life. And that's her quoting from uh, Lucan's poem, The Pharsalia. So, in, in its uh, verses, um, let me just read here, with which Pompey's wife Cornelia greets her husband after his shameful defeat in battle, offering to kill herself in sacrifice to placate the gods. So you can see how there's this uh, uh, poem, or I'm sorry, the, the, the works of Lucan that she had read, and the the this was art to which she had, had been exposed and she fixed the image inside herself and then confronted an extremist with this crisis. She, she conjured the image within her memory, recited the associated text and used it as a way to um, both explain to those around her who were capable of understanding it, but also to call out the intentio of that image, which is the steadfastness and virtue of a woman in defeat and she announced it to others to express where she was going to generate the resolve within herself that she needed to meet those circumstances. Uh, and, and, and thereby, you know, we, we come around to the idea of art and how it affects you with what we would call the motions today or the passions in the past. And finally, to this, this expression that Pharaoh brought up, which is why I wanted to bring up this whole little um, uh, tangent. What does it make you do? In this case, we saw how her exposure to this art and this history, this text um, motivated her. So I, I wonder what this brings to mind to, 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 for the two of you now. Mr. Mr. D, you go first, I've been talking too much. <sighs> ah, that's a tough one, um, Sammy Gog. Um, hmm. Well, part of the idea is that we have uh, passions, but they yeah. uh, they constrain and shape our behavior or, or, or they're answered with recourse to the art we've been exposed to. And so, hmm. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it is a good question. I mean, to what degree um, our experience of, you know, uh, our, our nature is, is directed by, you know, art. Of, of one one sort or the other um I, i'm afraid i, I you know I difficult difficult time with, well with, let me with... let me come at it from this direction w what role would you say you have seen or might suspect is there or whatever um as regards uh the art that interests you or you know for example like you put a, a lot of art out there um and mm. you've even got you've got warnings you know on your on your Twitter account, like, you know, um, midwits who come in and just uh, a, a bark and howl about something that, you know, do, isn't realistic enough or whatever are gonna be, you know, unceremoniously kicked to the curb. Um, do you see any any similar kind of thing where this artwork, uh, modern or ancient or, you know, Renaissance, whatever, how it gets used by people to frame what they're, doing I, I don't, mm. or, or, or their ethical choices. The only single thing I can see is romanticism and female suicide and an image of something like, you know, like, I don't know, a, a Dante Gabriel Rossetti or like a, like a, like yeah. a lady of Shalott. Right. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I think, um, I think this, this, this comes to a point that, uh, that Pharaoh 
brought up in another stream that, that you did about propaganda is, is that I think that mass forms have to some degree superseded uh, or to, to an extent the power of more traditional forms. Um, so I see people, yes, I see people all the time. In fact, I think it that it's a sort of epidemic of people modeling their lives and modeling their passions and expectations around fictions of various sorts around iconographies around art it just it's just the form of art is very different i think you know now it would be you know sort of fil films and you know anime and 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 and, and things like that um uh to a worrying degree i think I, you know i think that uh people are so immersed in art and its artifices and its fictions that uh, that they that they almost allow it to supersede any sort of real experience of of the passions or of the you know of the the, the senses uh i you know I, I i i i tend to be sort of an rather an elitist you know i i think that um i think that art the sort of things that I look at, whether it be fine art or, you know, music or, or you know, the poetry that I, I, I enjoy that it, that touches me. I mean, it's to me, it's it's. I think it's a it's a. I would be hard pressed to say that I I really feel that the the sort of ma again the ma the fic fic partially fictitious man on the street could come to any of the things that I enjoy and have it change his fundamental outlook or understanding or relationship to, to his self or his passions. Um, so I, I suppose I'm a bit pessimistic in that, in that sense. Uh, I think that it's more of a, it's more of a process than, than a kind of um, revelatory experience, you know? So I think that over time, kind of looking at things especially following the trajectory of a of a certain artist or a certain movement or a certain period you know you you sort of accumulate these things that 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 kind of then mold your relationship to the world and relationship to your to you to yourself and the relationship to religion or virtue or anything else uh, but I, I i think that it is it is work and and it is not something that is going to happen to most people. So, um, so we're back to I, the we're back to the yeah. subject then, and the likelihood yeah. of their of being able to interpret a given thing. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, it's it's you know, I, I I don't when I'm when I'm making artwork. I mean, when I'm really in the flow, as as people describe this experience of kind of. Uh, being swept about, swept away by uh, by immersion in a pro process, I, I don't think about those sorts of things. I mean, to me, it's irrelevant. Uh, you know, I don't care. I mean, uh, what how, how these these things are going to work in the world? Because uh, uh, back to w w what I said near the beginning of the stream, I I'm not in control of that. You know, once it's out of my mind and out of my hands it's really out of my hands. So, um, but I'm perhaps I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a debased modern, modern pessimist in that regard. I don't know, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I've, but as I said, it's, I, I, I have, I struggle with, with, with these issues. So I'd be very interested to hear what, what, what Ferro says, because I think he, you know, I think he would have a, have a much more kind of, much more kind of, uh, I don't know, integrated, uh, uh, thoughtful of response. Well, feel free also just to attack and abuse him. I mean, that's that's another option. Oh, I, I mean, I <laughs> one of my favorite pastimes is abusing Pharaoh, but uh... yes, like um, just just going back to Semiagog's kind of um, like last last point. I, I think that story in itself is really beautiful and really interesting. So, thank you for sharing that because I'd never never heard of it before. But I really like that idea as. Um, certain artworks being lodged into our memories um, that are then accessed in certain situations. And um, 
I guess even if you think about from a religious perspective, the whole idea of a religious text is to, you know, hear narratives or stories that will then act as, you know, guidance for our lives. And it's interesting how, um, you know, um, for Jesus, for example, was obsessed with parables. You know, he would often speak to um, the masses through a parable, which in itself is kind of like a short story or, um, you know, like a, a picture in words or whatever in, in, in many ways. And so it's kind of like he's, he's creating those kind of little artworks to stay in our heads. Um, so that, we, so that we remember them. And another interesting example of that is something like uh, Aesop's Fables, where it's kind of like small moral stories being turned into sh- short, <laughs> short, like a moral statement or a moral idea being turned and transformed into an artwork that's then lodged into the memory so that you can have then um, re- remember it. Going, going on to Dee's point around you know, there is there are different levels of strata. There is the elite versus the, the the mass man, and the question is, you know, can the the, 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 the sorry the the all, all of this kind of elite level stuff is never going to appeal to the mass man, and it never should do. Um, to, to these points, you know, there's no way that um you you, you going off the street is going to have the uh, level of erudition and even the time to um, the time and the inclination to to build up the symbolic landscape to interpret ideas, and so th- there's an interesting question as to you know if we're saying that you know some art can be lodged in people's memories, h- how do you how do you appeal to that mass ma- man through art which is intrinsically elite, if that makes sense? Well why, well, why would you want to? I mean, you know, I, I, this this gets to my point of <laughs> that I do, I don't really care, you know. Like, I, I just think if you if you're you're thinking as an ad man rather than an artist, right? This you're you're thinking of persuasion, and I I'm thinking of you know, well, uh, if I persuade anyone with any aspect of something that I make, then good, very good. But I I can't I can't make that a goal. You know, because you know, I, I just it's it's outside of my it's out of my hands. You know, I do think that these things can be powerful, but I I think that it's going to be to a vanishingly small number of people. You know, um, good. I mean, if it if it happens, good. You know, and and certainly in my own experience, you know, my my way in the world is very much just littered with scraps of images and you know uh um bits of of poetry and song and music and i i think of them all the time and you know uh i uh in in all circumstances but you know i i grew up uh very much surrounded by by the arts of one form or another and, and took to it very early on so it did form a part of my f- foundational consciousness um but uh you know but in the end i you know i don't i, I don't really care I, I think it's futile to this idea of sort of elevating or uh or pushing pushing people to, towards something specific uh that's not what i'm in it for maybe some some artists creators of things are you know but uh, i i can't relate to that at all um, and, and we we have this expectation of it instantaneously happening, you know. So I I put some some you know I'll put some I'll tweet out some art, talk about casting pearls before swine. So I put some <laughs> art on Twitter, <laughs> and and people you know and so you know that then I think it, it it presents itself the idea is like okay here's this this painting, what do you think of it? You know, here it is, react to it. You know, and that's not really what I'm trying to do i mean it's Im- to me it's immaterial i don't care if if you like it or not if it if it if it moves you or not but it because i as i said i think it's a long process i don't think that just encountering a work of art in one instance especially on a medium like twitter or something like that i don't think that's really gonna gonna do it but it but it but it may 
start to build up a kind of library of 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 ideas in someone's mind over time and and if if one person if it if it works that way for one person great you know but um but you know i i think we we expect that uh you know put someone in front of great art and it, and and it will transform them and I, it just doesn't work that way i see school children being filed well like again this was pre pre coof but uh you know this idea of school children being filed before great art in a museum or gallery or something like that and you know well, what does, if, that, what if, does that transform them have they received the holy wisdom i don't, what, I don't, what I don't if, know what if we change it from art right uh, it just mm -hmm. because art is a stand-in for something that produces an uh, aesthetic impression right let's just yes, uh, yes. Yeah, it's a quick yeah. gloss right so what if we just say beauty beauty will certainly move people we run into all kinds of problems with how to define it like to me a tit job is horrifying but other people who aren't capable of seeing it to come to pharaoh's idea of you know whether or not or your idea d of, of whether or not the public has has the, the the necessary perception and knowledge to distinguish you know the 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 more and from my subjective position you know the more objectively beautiful thing from the less right that being the the real tits versus the the false ones. Now we don't need to get into D jokes about whether any of them are attractive, right? But um, but the 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 point being that you know perhaps we can substitute a, a beauty for art, and now ask yourself whether or not you think it will affect people or form impressions or move them or spur them in a particular way, and whether there's any hope that it might do so. Can, can I? I want to answer that point. Can I just? say one thing to yeah. D before before we move on if that's okay and 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 just just one example of um elite elite forms of art inspiring virtue in um in the common man and that's church art and i think there's a really interesting connection between the church as patron of art and then realizing the power that it has on, on the masses you know i can i can totally imagine a peasant who has um, you know, he's never read a book in his life, has seen um, this amazing mosaic of God and the transcendent and the world beyond and said, I'm not going to mess with that guy. Uh, I'm going to live a virtuous life as best as I can do. Um, and so, so I, I, I do think there are, are examples. I, I think to your point, D, if, if we send people around the National Gallery and expect them to come out as these kind of virtuous people that's not that's not going to happen but you, you, you need that purpose behind the, the art the um those christian uh, com commissions would have had that kind of layer built in Go, going on to going on to semiagog's point as you know beauty beauty as the inspirer of virtue i think again i do think there's something interesting and tr and true here and, and i just feel like we're, we're just living in this ugly age an age where there is nothing new and there's nothing beautiful and as part as part of um attempts to kind of equalize it everyone um you know like we're, we're there's there's no such th there's no such thing as elite art you know there's anyone's arts good you know everything everything's accessible um that everything has just kind of become this mushy gray color there is there is nothing be beautiful or amazing anymore and, and I, I think um, you know, if if we're to create something that's going to inspire people to break away with the structures of today, it has to be beautiful. Isn't is is, 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 is uh, there's a, there's a famous quote around? Um, yeah, to, to break down the USSR, you have to create something beautiful. And I think there's uh, yeah, truth to that. I, I don't know. I actually think there's too much. There's too much beauty in the world. You know, in a sense, um, I, I say that sort of facetiously, but I think that one of the one of the problems of today is we're so oversaturated with sensation of all sorts. Yes, the, the I think the you know the, the medieval peasant, the medieval man in the street, when entering a church and seeing these images, it would be extremely striking. But it would be striking because it is unusual to his experience. Um, even down to the pigments, to the reflectivity, to the colors, yeah. things that he, he or she would not, would not see in normal. Yes, life. he's never going to see that that thing. You know, I mean, you 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 sort of you know you think of that celestial, transcendent blue of of, of lapis ultramarine. Uh, you know that 
you know, it's so striking because of its rarity. But now you can see that you can see that chroma on on a on a monitor, you know, LCD. I mean, yes, a, a, this, a computer this, monitor. You the sixteen you million giggling candy clown colors of the eye of of the horror of Babylon, as I call it. Yeah, yes, exactly. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go, there is a there is this this aesthetic. Everything is aestheticized. Everything is you know uh, down to a turn to a toilet brush. You know, you 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 find high design and a. A bloody right, with with toilet, sparkles, <laughs> toilet right. brush, you know. So that we're just so saturated that I think at a certain point, you know, it's it's like when you're, um, you know, it's like if you're in a room with a with a, either a, a really good smell or a horrible smell. At a certain point, your brain says, "Okay, this is the steady state of this room in terms of smell. I don't need to think about it anymore." And and suddenly you don't really notice it anymore. And I think it's the same. It's the same with with. You know, with art and, and aesthetics and beauty and all of this, there's just so much of it around that you know, we become jaded connoisseurs. Any miserable person in Brixton, you know, can see the great glories of man anytime he wants. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a very con that's a very convincing argument, and and I think you're right in terms of, you know, we've we've been like. I almost feel like there's, there's, two, there's two points in there. I think there's one on sensa sensations in general, and that includes the beautiful things and the not beautiful things. I, I think we are just being bombarded constantly all the, all the time. We wake up, we're on our phones, we, we walk down the street and there's, there's billboards. Um, you know, we, we, like you said, every, every single part of our lives, we think about aesthetic. So... But I, I wouldn't necessarily say that all of those experiences are beautiful. I just feel like you're right. We're just overloaded with stuff, so you don't. We, we can't really. We don't have the time to reflect on it. Again, con considering that that case of the the peasant, again, you know, going to the church once a week to have that moment is gonna is gonna cause a point of reflection as well. And may, maybe we are seeing beautiful things during our day. Or or again, like you said, maybe we, we've kind of looked up a great artist online. But because like you said, it's just another disposable experience, we never have a chance to really go deep into it. Yeah. And and one of my favorite passages from um uh, po poetry, uh from a favorite poet of mine, T. S. Eliot. Um, from the wasteland, you know, what are the root, roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images. Where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. You know, and I think that is the, you know, he was pointing out the, the beginning of this condition where it's just, you know, we, 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 everything is is just fallen into a, into a jumble and, and, uh, and it, it, everything is unmoored and broken, and, and we, we suffer from this this great excess. But also with this excess, the, with this excess, there's there's it, it's also so unmoored from you know back to the topic of you know virtue and heroism and 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 transcendence and God and all of these concepts that uh, you know that the the modern person just just sighs and goes to sleep. Yes, uh, the, the 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 point at which the the bombarded, the, the the bombardment of one's senses with with shit, you know, just causes this sort of catatonia. It just causes you to shut down, you know. Um, it, 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 there is a there is. I, I want to try to keep this under two hours because at that point, you know, if I, I cut it short just before the two hour mark, then I'm able to have it auto load over to Odyssey <laughs> and also not to, um, uh, to um, uh, press too much on the, the, the goodwill and the uh, indulgence of my um, guests. So I, I would ask if um, sort of in the time we have remaining, perhaps I could get you guys to come all the way back around to the, the starting point, which is the idea of using one's sense of aesthetics as a tool to navigate through life, I would be curious um, to hear, you know, uh, for f f five, six minutes, each of you, um, whether or not you've had any luck in your lives with using your aesthetics as a, a, a tool to guide you. Um, as certainly, I'm not asking you to, uh, to give up on any personal information. In fact, I'd ask quite the opposite, but perhaps you can um, share with uh, me and our audience 
some that your impression of whether or not it's possible to navigate using one's sense of aesthetics and if you if one does how how it goes so just, no, maybe, maybe i'll chip, chip in first um I, I think aesthetics has affected me in multiple ways in my life i i, I think firstly in terms of you know I'm, I'm a big believer in the passions today even though they are forgotten and i think some of the kind of key moments in my life to to kind of fire up those passions in a really positive way that have come through um, artworks, whether they are, uh, you know, paintings or, you know, writings of people. And even the most base sense of just being um, awed and amazed by um, these people in time who have created these beautiful and brilliant things and just ha how insignificant we are like this uh, today uh, you know I, I just feel like we're just the average the average man is just the average elite and the average man is just so much lower than people of the past and when you kind of read people's writings that inspire you and um, you know the words leap off the page that uh, you know you feel physically fired up um, as, as a human and, and I felt like um, all, all I can do is to recommend to people to try and you know live this aesthetic life to um, to become a lover of the arts um, and of the best kind and to have a passion and to, to raise up your passions in it because you know it, it creates that drive and um, interest and um, you know re re regarding the virtue I, I do re I do really love that idea of that uh, nun that you were talking about at the start uh, or in the middle um, semi-agog and you know I, I can definitely f think of times where I've tried to kind of lean on um, ideas and notions that weren't inside of me that I've heard about from other works of art or seen from other works of art whether that's kind of channeling it into a heroic figure you know I, I really like the, the kind of Roman notions that are around things like Hercules where they would literally wear, like Romans would wear a club around their neck but, um, to kind of gain the protection of Hercules. But you're also kind of channeling the, that kind of heroic figure as part of that uh, artwork and part of that emblem that, that goes, on, goes on you. And so I think, you know, that this, if, if we are to defeat the, the foul entropic miasma of modern life, we need to do it in a, in a beautiful and aesthetic way. And would you say that um, your sense of aesthetics has guided you well in life, or have you found that you were, uh, you know, that that line, you know, so may the outward show be least themselves, the world is still deceived with ornament. Would you would you say it's a safe uh, tool to guide you, a sense of aesthetics, or that it, it has ever led you astray? Uh, it's it's a good question. Like, uh, you, you you do need guidance, and again, that's the that's again the purpose of, you know, this is why I I love uh, kind of watching these feeds on on artworks because he's coming at it from a certain certain place a place of you know greater understanding and knowledge of, than i have and so um you know i think you need to almost have those kind of uh, figures that you um look up to you know I, I i was always really inspired by um is it is it george clark's civilization series on bbc i can't remember his first name um kenneth right Ken, uh, yeah, kenneth, Ken, uh, yeah. kenneth clark yeah yeah, exactly. And, and again, this idea of someone else guiding you through what, you know, his idea of pure aesthetics is. And again, try, trying to find those um, figures to take us through those um, moments, super important, because if you're doing it by yourself and if you're doing it through what the state tells you, you know, I, I remember my GCSE art was was terrible. I, you know, I, I learned nothing whatsoever. I had a really bad experience from what the state was trying to teach me and the kind of artist they were trying to show me. But then, but then through listening to people with more experience and understanding than myself and being guided, that's where I felt like I, I got more out of it. So it's, I think it is down to, um, you know, the amount of effort you put in and the people that you associate with as well. Very good. And uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. D. I would say, you know, the one thing that binds, you know, for all our differences, Mr. Mr. Farrow and myself, is 
is I, I have very much the same experience. I, you know, I, um, I, in fact, I am almost ravaged by aesthetics. Uh, I, I think that in it, it, it has sometimes, it is sometimes had, has my pursuit of these things has been has made my life a bit difficult. You know, because I, you know, I've just always been oriented towards towards kind of looking for aesthetic perfection or stimulation in everything so i can't you know have a cup of tea without thinking about you know the, the teacup and the or or, of the... or just any old letter opener i looked with envy upon your uh, letter opener you posted a picture of yeah <laughs> yeah exactly i mean you know and, and to an absurd degree and you know i've always been so oriented towards that and i and i i cannot tolerate sort of you know ugliness in my in my own life certainly in my home uh or in in in, in you know in my experiences so uh, yes i mean I, I i'm i've you know i'm i've always been so pushed by that um and, and i'm very sensitive to to you know to 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 beauty uh in a way so i think that it has it has at some times helped me and helped guide me towards virtue. But I think that it, it also equally can, can do the opposite. And certainly in my pursuits of uh, um, uh, physical relationships, it, be, the pursuit of beauty can, can take you in exactly the wrong direction. So straight, it, straight into the hell mouth. It, yes. So, I, th I, you know, I, I, um, I rely on other things. I mean, certainly, I rely on, you know, you know sort of my, my, my sort of faith and morality, and uh, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a religious sense, to, to kind of help me, help me, uh, in a way, temper the, these passions and temp and temper the, uh, you know, this this path of beauty. But uh, but I but it is very important to me, and I, I would say it's probably very it's probably much more important to me than it would be to the average person, um, for for one reason or another. You know, I don't know. I don't know the origin of this. I don't know why I've become. You know, why I'm oriented in this way. Uh, I'm very happy to because I feel like I have a, a sort of um, a channel that allows me to. To sort of be sensitive to the things that the, the beauties that that God has brought forth, you know, on the earth, you know. So I do consider it lucky, but I do think that you you also have to be very careful. I don't think that aesthetics and beauty can be your only guide because I think uh, uh, again it can just as much lead you astray as it can lead you uh, to righteousness. Well, a very, a very nice closing remark there. That last bit, you know, um, it can it can lead you. Uh, uh, what's it off off like a gang stray a, a glay? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, um, I don't know what I just said. Um, at this point, uh, it would seem uh, prudent of me, uh, or, or rather uh, proper of me, at this point to ask you two if either of you have things you want to sh uh, shill. I know Pharaoh has a channel with a discussion of art, uh, artistic periods, artistic schools, uh, and that sort of thing that I've enjoyed uh, uh, following, watching. I'm subscribed. I encourage everyone else to. Um, uh, D, I'm not going to make any remarks about cookbooks, um, uh, does not have a channel, but I wonder if uh, the two of you, uh, maybe Pharaoh go first, if you have anything that you want to uh, shill or promote. Uh, I'm, I'm also, I also help run the uh, Foundations Architecture Podcast, which is a short podcast taking us through um, the different, the, all like the history of architecture uh, with Owine, if you're familiar with him from uh, AA Stream. Yes, yes. Um, so pl yeah, please check that out. But uh, no, I've been, we've, we've been going through um, the Symbolist Painters, myself, Panama Hat, and uh, the excellent uh, Alexander Adams. Um, and that's been a real fun tour of quite a niche uh, artistic group that you may not necessarily have heard of in mainstream sources so uh, we're already up to part two and hopefully we'll be doing part three um, this month so uh, yeah lots of content yeah I've been enjoying the talk about the uh, the symbolists yes quite a bit um, uh, Mr. D 
Uh, I, I have nothing to show. Um, again, no no comments on this uh, this this illusory cookbook <laughs> that people like to bring up. But um, uh, you know, if people people are interested in my um, my uh, sort of pointless ramblings, I every week I talk to this strange man who calls himself academic agent um, on his channel. So if you if you're interested, you can you can just look him up. And uh, there's a show called Unpopular Opinions where this strange man and myself and other wonderful people, including um, Semiagog and Pharaoh at times, uh, talk about any all and sundry topics. So that that's uh, that's where you can that's where you can find me. Or you can you know you can uh, you can look me up on Twitter if you want to hear my vituperative occasional comments on the contemporary life and a few paintings that you may love or hate. Excellent. Um, well, uh, this is a perfect point uh, at, at which I should come in once again and say that I only know about the, these two gentlemen and uh, am able to have them on as guests because the great talent scout AA, academic agent, has had uh, them on his channel. I do note, however, that uh, Mr. D has just completely elided right over uh, deepest lore and cigar streams because he's jealous of them. Uh, does not <laughs> appear on them. And, um, no, I appear. <laughs> I appear on the deep deepest lore quite frequently. So uh, uh, I see. I see. It's the know. cigar streams that that. It's the cigar your, your stream. Resentment. I'm the eternal enemy of the cigar stream. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, Charlemagne appears on the cigar streams uh, uh, quite often, so I recommend all of uh, AA stuff. The the, the 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 main thing about him is he's, he's fucking funny. I, I just, it's so nice to actually like listen to some live content and have it be funny. I don't, I don't have that skill. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a funny person, at least, at least not in the laughing with me kind of way, more in the laughing at me kind of way. So I, I really highly recommend AA's channel and check out his um, academic agency where he has these free courses of his. Uh, really can't recommend him highly enough. Really enjoy his stuff. And you two gentlemen, thank you very, very much for uh, being on. I do appreciate it. And hopefully in the future, some proper topics will occur to uh, one or the other or both of you. And uh, I, perhaps I can have you on again at some point. Very, very happy to be here. And it was, it, was, it was great. And thank you very much for, uh, for having me. And, yes. Yeah. Uh, well then, um, uh, any final words, gentlemen, before I, before I shut it down? Uh, beauty is truth and truth is beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. <laughs> I suppose. Uh, well then. Little, Keat, little Keats in there for you. Yes, yes. Pharaoh, anything final? Final word? No, nothing Nothing as pithy as that, I'm afraid. It's just keep, it, just keep, keep on chasing the uh, aesthetics. Well, well, there it is. Then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, uh, wonderful guests, or one and all, I thank you all. Uh, I am a semi and uh, now I am out.